Hello and welcome to another Build a Soil YouTube episode. Today we have season five, episode eight, and I'm pretty excited because things took really well to the transplant, which is all you really worry about when you're doing live demonstrations because you want it to go well. And if it goes wrong, you know, it's in a whole bunch of soil. And so then we'd have to start correcting things. However, things are great. But we did make a huge mistake already with the blue mat. And part of why I have not used blue mats is because of these calibration issues. And the reason that I decided to start using them is that I had a great team of people at Sustainable Village to help me overcome my learning curve. And the main function of this YouTube is to teach you. And so in the past, I'd have problems with calibration. And really, I had problems because I was running a perpetual garden. So nonstop was I, like every week I'd pull a plant out and I'd have to recalibrate. Now that I have more of a, you know, one room, so to speak, at a time, flipping the flower, it should be pretty easy to keep the blue mats going. First and foremost, we'll walk through, I'll show you what it looks like, and then we're going to address the blue mat problem. Then I'm gonna take some clones off of here because I need to do some defoliating. Then we're gonna do some super cropping and a little bit of defol, and we'll discuss some of those basics. Then we're gonna move into a little bit of discussion about the blue mat as far as how the moisture meter works because today to address this problem, part of the reason why I had an issue was I was not using the moisture meter to make sure that I was calibrated and dialed in. And the main reason I wasn't using it is you've gotta soak it for an hour and during the last recording, I wanted to make sure that I showed, my, showed inserting the moisture meter. So if I did it between episodes, it wouldn't work and I couldn't record until today. And I set up the blue mat, I think four or five days ago. So in any ways, we'll get to all that stuff. I've got the blue mat moisture meter soaking. Let's talk about quadrant one real quick. Quadrant one, we flooded the blue mat. So you can see the shop vacs here, a little bit of moisture in the bottom. I'm gonna shop vac the rest out. Today, we're gonna get a reading on the blue mat meter of what the maximum moisture for this 3.0 soil is. And it should tell us because we've hit runoff, which is past the maximum saturation point. And part of the blue mat discussion we're gonna have on a whiteboard a little bit after this is to explain the moisture curve and how it works so you can better understand how to irrigate with or without a blue mat and understand the target zone and what we're looking for. Next, I've got the auto pot looking really good. I've just been top watering so far. I would like to start bottom watering, but I really wanna give it like 10 days. We're basically gonna be hooking up this mainly for flower, but I, I hope to veg about two weeks in here. It's been about four days, five days, so we've got another 10 days at the most as far as veg time because I don't wanna overshoot the height. I might go a little longer, we'll see, because I'm gonna do some training. But that'll give me a little more time to hook up the reservoir and I'll do a video, I promise, on how I hook up the Autopot XXL. Next, we've got the earth box. And what I'm really hoping to do after we do the discussion on the blue mats is to use the tensiometer meter to give you the reading on how wet an earth box actually runs because there's a lot of conversation about how to set your blue mat, and what tension the soil should be at. And they use a millibar reading and we can use KPA or Pascal, we can, we can use PSI as far as how, how much it takes to pull. There's all these mathematical conversions. I just wanna speak in the same language. So as far as the millibar on the blue mat meter, I'd like to discuss what a good number is for living soil so that all of you that use them can kind of compare yourself to what I think, as well as share what you think is a really good number. And in turning this into numbers, we can share information with each other a little bit easier. That was the hope with the, uh, the EcoWit moisture sensor. But that uses a, a percentage of depletion or a maximum holding of water and how much less it has in it. We'll discuss that because that's one point versus the tension and uh, we'll go over that today. Next over here, we've got the 30, the 15, the seven and the five and all of them are looking beautiful. Really, I've only had to water the five and the seven. These two have been kind of holding and I did a little top water. So, so far I've not done any feeding on anything. And although it's in, well, we have the feeding schedule and you can be adding a few things it's in Fresh 3.0, it's in, only been in there four or five days. So the next video that I do will be on environment, cover crop, mulch, and I'll also discuss following the build a soil schedule and the difference of feeding here and top dressing here versus how little I'm gonna do there. Then we have our multiple no cycle bed. I think this is its third or fourth cycle. I forget which season we set this up on. It took, it just hooked up beautifully. The only thing I will say that I noticed is between the last rounds, I let this dry down a little bit so I can move the bed around clean up underneath it. And one of the things that that did is it got a little bit hydrophobic in some areas. And I think that may still be a lingering issue. 
So I gave it a pretty good watering to run off. I'm gonna do another good watering with just the Kuyaha and just make sure I really get it slowly watered with the Chapin. Um, and then what I'd like to do is once I, I target in with the moisture meter from the blue mat, I'm gonna eventually add one in here so that we can compare earth box, a uh, big bed of soil versus the 20 gallon, and then just kind of compare the, the tension readings on there versus the eco wit readings. And then people watching this YouTube can have all sorts of data to be able to compare what they're doing with me. And I think that's a really good place to start. Otherwise the color and the new growth and how like I'm just very happy with this whole bed. So the goal today will be to take some cuts off of here, pull some of this cover crop that's climbing all the way up, down and do a little defoliation. And then uh, we're gonna get to the, the blue mat final discussion. And we'll go from there. So let's get going. First and foremost, let's talk about the blue mat. So if you've already watched the setup video, what I did was I set this up and calibrated it to a hanging drip, and then I moved it to one carat. If you remember, the carat is a marking on top of the blue mat meter here. Now, not the moisture meter, but this is the carat that actually delivers the, the water. And so if you remember in there, there's a tube of water to a ceramic connection. And when it starts to dry out, it calls for water. And depending on how tight you have this or loose you have this, that's how much water is going to be released. I set it at one carat, not two carats. And that could be a problem because that's about the maximum moisture. When we get to the curve discussion, one carat setting is pretty good for living soil because that should have been 50 to 70 as far as the millibar rating. And that's pretty wet, but that's what, what soil likes, what living soil likes. And two carats probably would have put me slightly drier, but we decided to go a little bit more moist. Then here's the key mistake that I made. I set the hanging drip. I set it to one carat, which is a little bit on the moist side for soil. And you'll notice I moved the reservoir. I decided I didn't want it hanging here right at five feet like my system was set up for. I wanted to put it on the roof. And that was after I'd already calibrated the hanging drip based on the gravity pressure of that much water at five feet high. So when I moved it, not double, but near double the height, that really increased the pressure. I already had it on the wet side. So now my hanging drip calibration wasn't perfect. And it actually got to the point where I got to run off. So today I'm going to put the meter in. I'm going to do it right now. Then while I'm working, I'm going to let it kind of target in the zone and get a reading off of it. That'll tell me how overly wet I've got my blue mat calibrated. If I had to guess, I'd say that the setting I have with the number of carats I have turned on there is probably dialed in at like 25 or 30, which is just too wet. So I'm going to tighten it a little and that should allow me to release a little wet, less water, which should get me one carat is about 40 millibar, 30, 40. So I'm going to close it maybe a little more than a carat and that should bring me back up before the water turns back on. I've actually got it off. I refilled the reservoir because it was bone dry. So we're gonna go over what happens if you've got it set too wet and you lose the water. First off, you can see the plant's very happy. Even though it hit maximum saturation, for a plant that big, it was probably only three gallons of water in there, which means it barely got overwatered. which means that even with the runoff occurring, it was kind of like I just did a deep watering for the day, especially because I caught it right away. So I shot backed it out, I'm gonna recalibrate it, I'm going to open the lines. I'm going to purge the air and this thing should probably just sit and it's not going to call for water for a while, but I will now have the moisture meter giving me the moisture reading so I can tell if it should have turned on or if it shouldn't be watering, right? So let's get into it. I think you'll understand better as I go. I've got the moisture meter cap in here and this is not waterproof. So it comes with a protective cover so you can water without ruining it. And I'll put that on when I'm done. For right now, before I turn it on, I do not want to turn it on until it's connected. And I've got it down here soaking. And before I do this, I'll tell you, if you've already got one of these at home and maybe you're thinking it wasn't working very well, they are very sensitive. But in discussing with the Sustainable Village guys about the blue mat sensor, resetting is holding the button down and that resets it, but it needs to be on the actual soaked blue mat meter. <coughs> so when you connect it, it's resetting where the vacuum should be that much pressure. If you've set it incorrectly without it being attached, you now need to do a hard reset because it's kind of reset to zero and it wasn't at zero. The hard reset, you actually have to undo the screws, remove it, disconnect the power, reconnect the power, put it back together. So if you've got a meter that you recalibrated incorrectly or you've not been using, you can reset them and then they will work perfectly. So let me grab this 
The idea is it's been soaking for one hour to create that absolutely no air, which creates the vacuum. And this isn't moisture, um, this isn't waterproof, so I'm gonna connect it here. I've got kind of like a bulge on there because of surface tension. That's exactly what I want, a little bulge after it's been soaking for an hour, and I'm gonna connect it. Now I'll turn it on. That's what you wanna have happen. It's at zero right now. So I'm going to insert it, and I'm gonna insert it near where I have my carrot because that's where I'd like to read the moisture. So I'm gonna go in basically right next to it. There we are. Now I shouldn't see a reading instantly because it's gonna to have to adjust. So I'm gonna go ahead and put the cap on. We're gonna let it calibrate for a little bit and then we'll get a reading off of it. Cap on. The other thing I didn't do in the original video, which is not that important in my setup, but it comes with some stakes and that will actually hold this in place before the roots get all the way out here. I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of lock this down. That way when I put the mulch on and all that, I know that this is being held down. I'm gonna come back and get a, a reading on that in a little bit. Let's go on to the other quadrants. Well, we can do a little bit in here. So since these are gonna get tall and I know it, I could either top it, I could start super cropping, I could start lollipopping, I could fem it. These are all the terms that you're gonna hear. And since we're an educational channel, I just go over the basics over and over. Topping, for me, I would come in and I would want all these side branches to be the, the top. So I'd come in probably right here and I would top that whole piece and then it would be a bush. But I'd be removing this much biomass. I could keep it as a clone. It might slow down my growth because I, I removed five, six inches of plant material. So it would have to regrow that much, that much biomass. I could also top just the top, but then that leaves a little bit of height up here. I could top just the top, then I could super crop it to allow these to get taller. Here's the rule of thumb. When this top is below the others, the others get the hormone. So bending, topping, it all works the same. The FEM is the F-I-M, and that's typically on a much smaller plant because you can top really early, get the, like the branched out shape, but without removing very much biomass. So if this was smaller, I would consider that, and you actually just go and you remove just the newest growth tip right there. And they call it FEM or I missed it because a lot of times you'd be really trying to get just the newest top out and you might miss and get a little part. And then sometimes it'll grow like four tops instead of two or whatever. And it's just one of the methods. The next one is LST, low stress training. Some people actually take like a hook or string and tie it to the edge and they just bend it like this. It's called low stress training because you're not stressing it at all. You're just moving it and forcing it to react to that. I like a little higher stress training, mainly because it's easier and I don't need tools. And that's what I'm gonna do on all these plants in here instead of topping them. So this is gonna be the super cropping and it's the method I like the most. My goal will be to get this top lower than the side branches so the branches get that oxen hormone and they start growing to the top. That helps when you have a flat light canopy. We want more even branches flat. We don't want like the Christmas tree shape like is good for outside when the sun is going around the plant, okay? So I'm gonna pinch right here. I'm pinching on the side, then I rotate and I go to the other sides and I pinch. And the idea is to be gentle here. I can feel this has got really good mobility. It's kind of rubbery and I'm happy with that. So I'm gonna go full boat. I'm going all the way down to a hard super crop. Now, when you're a brand new grower, you might think, oh my God, I just hurt my plant. And it might freak you out, especially if someone else does it for you and they don't tell you what they're doing. But this now means, because that's lower, that these are gonna shoot up in growth. And then what I'll do is I'll grab my scissors. And since I'm in here, I can do a little defoliation. I'm gonna pull off some of the big leaves. I'm gonna pull off this big leaf that's now sideways. I'm gonna pull off some of these lowers that are kind of like, not really a sucker, but like, I don't need this to be production for me in flower. I'd rather the branch get taller. And so I'm gonna remove a lot of these little lowers down here. This is what they consider lollipopping. Because like a lollipop, it has a, just a smooth stick and all of the, the substance is up top. I'm doing the same thing here. I've lollipopped it all the way. I could do it all the way to the very top. I leave a couple up here because they are, have a great chance of being good flower producers. Next, I'm gonna go to the same thing. I'm removing. Now, you could remove just the sucker like that and leave the leaf because the leaf can receive light. I like to clean them out fully when I'm going down to the lowers like this. You can also pinch with your fingers. Many different ways to go depending on the plant. All right, that looks pretty good. I'm not taking much off. I'm just gonna leave this material in here. The earth box is gonna be covered 
and I'll be doing that soon with a top dressing and a plastic cover. I've got to put the plastic cover on soon because I need to like put it around this plant. If it gets, the plant gets too big, I just cut a big hole in my earth box cover, put it on, and then I kind of tape it back together. So there's always a way. But that's essentially what I'm gonna do to all these plants right now. So let me just get after it. I'm gonna go ahead and do some super cropping. You can bend which direction you want it to go. Sometimes there's no preference, but I just want, you know, you can kind of control every little bit if you'd like. Looks pretty good. I could probably go a little more, but I'll just do a little bit at a time. Also with these, it's up to you. You can just leave them like this. They're pretty thin. Sometimes I'll take them all like this and I'll just chop them up. Either for the worm bin or just basically as fertilizer for here. Okay. Now, if your stem feels kind of woody or you feel it's hollow because it's growing so fast and you feel it snap, be very careful on the bend. You may want to kind of abort and just do a pinch, come back for another day because you can snap the whole top off. Worst case, you force topped it. It's not the end of the world. There we go. That should be good. This is the fruit by the funk and I'm really enjoying this one right now. These ones are so easy. The fruit by the funk is, is like greasy and rubbery. So it's easy to super crop. That's something I really like in an indoor genetic that I'm looking to run so that I can train it and it won't mind. This one's getting bushy already. I noticed in the 30 gallon, interesting. Some new growth is starting to throw longer. This one's so tall, I'm gonna super crop this side branch too. Doesn't have to be just the main. You can just control bushiness all across the board. See like down here, this little tiny branch is so low. Even though it got longer, it's not just hugging. I'm gonna still remove it because it's so low. Other thing which you can kind of see some remnants of damage of is I went and got a, a long piece of quarter inch tubing for my RO to hook up to a float valve on the humidifier. And when I did it, it was black tubing. And so I just disconnected the black tube from the RO and put that one in. Well, that was the discharge for the dirty water. So I ran the humidifier full of water and then ran it for about a week with dirty water. And I came in here and all the leaves were white. I was like, what the hell? So I foliar sprayed them and I immediately caught the problem and fixed it. So lots of little problems. The key is to be aware and observant and you can, you can course correct. You can still have a really good run. I think the issues that we've had so far are very, very small, but they could have been big had we let them, you know, fester. So I think that's pretty good for those. Let's do this last one here. Okay, that's all I wanted to do. It looks really good. Now, I basically want to do the same thing over here, but before I get started, I always, when I'm facing like this, this is number one, number two, number three, number four. I go top to bottom, left to right. And so I've got four cups here labeled one, two, three, four. These are gonna be what I use to determine which one of these I like the best. I'll have the keeper on backup. So instead of me taking tops, which I could totally do, I like the height that we're at and I'm probably gonna start opening this up under a scrog screen. So today I'm gonna do lots of pinching. But before I get into that, I'm gonna go to the number one one and I'm gonna actually take off any lowers that could be a good clone and I don't need here. So let's see, here's a really good one. Would have never made it up all the way and that'll make a really good cutting. So I'm gonna go over here and I could just clean it up above the soil, feed the worm, so to speak. We've gone over clones a lot, so I'm not gonna get into great detail at all. We just did it as part of this series. I'm just gonna store that in number one. And then when I go to puck them up, I like to soak them for like 24 hours. I'll put a little aloe in here and then I will puck them up later. So I'm sure to get a keeper out of there. I wanna get at least two off of each. It's another good one, looking great. Okay. Now, when I'm cleaning these up, if there's any more, that's fine. But essentially what I'm doing right now is making sure that I don't mess anything up by getting the minimum two. This one I'll probably take two. That was just a little bit low. So I got three. And now as I'm uh, super cropping and defoliating, if I find any more, I'll go ahead and put them in the cup. But at least for sure now I know I've got my minimum. Now I'll take the number three. That one, see how the leaves are kind of crinkly? It's been so shaded, it was so low. That's not a good one for me. So I'm just gonna mulch that and I'm gonna find a slightly better one that's also still low. 
Here's one better example. One leaf got a little turned under. It just happens when they're fully vibrant and getting light and then they get bushed out, but it still looks stout. So I'm gonna go with this one. Okay, that's the number three. That's a good one. It was just gonna crowd out and bush out here. So this will be one I take. Ooh, this one's loud. That's a good sign when you're just cutting them and they start to stink up. Okay. Now we'll go to the fourth one. Looks pretty good, but it's got a big angle on it. I'll keep it, but I hate it when they're all angled. I don't know why. <laughs> they grow out of it. Okay, fourth. There we go. All right, so now I've got the minimum of, of cuts, so I'm sure to back this up. Now I'm free to just go do work in here. I'm not gonna put on camera all the work that I do in here because it might take me a little longer and I might do some of it in the morning. But the gist of it is I don't want these to keep getting bigger. And even though I already topped these, so it's, it's got kind of a bushiness going on, I'm gonna start super cropping all of these. Now, one of the benefits of super cropping is as they recover, where you pinch and bend, they recover into a big knot, like a callus. And supposedly they can flow nutrients through there. It's almost like when you stress yourself out working out, you now grow bigger muscles. When you stress the plant here, it's gonna recover at that injury point stronger than ever. And apparently it can hold more weight, move more nutrients, all of the above. But see how bushy it is already? Now all these lowers are getting more light. I will defoliate a little bit in here, like some of the lowers, just like on the previous plants, are so low. I don't want them to rob growth or crowd out space. I'll try and keep it up top. That's what I'm gonna do on all of these. You'll see the recovery and you'll be like, wow, it looks great. So don't be scared. They bounce back so well to this kind of treatment. The only fear is if you overdo the super crop, maybe a snap one, but it's not the end of the world. Okay, so I've still got more defoliation to do, but I really wanna to get to the blue mat conversation. And as we go deep into the seasons, although I'm gonna keep teaching the fundamental basics over and over, I don't want to overthink it to the point where I don't have time to record. I just want to document what we're doing. Yeah, this one's nice. It's number four. It's loud. It's sticky. It's already got some funk going. So, all right. I want to just do all of it right now, but I don't have time. I will come in and defoliate here. Main thing I wanted to show you. We got the cuttings. We're super cropping. Heck, even the mom I could super crop if I want to get the mom bush here for more cuts. So I will move this material kind of in the middle. Feed it all uniformly here. In the next video, as I mentioned, I will be putting cover crop down. I'll be putting mulch down on all, the, all of these. We normally don't leave bare soil, but each one of these steps takes a little bit of time. And so I could do it tomorrow morning or something, but if I'm not filming, then it won't be ideal. So we'll get to the next setup. I'll plan for it. We'll put cover crop, mulch, all of that. Okay, so I just finished doing the walk around. We'll look at the blue mount meter and see what the reading says. And then we're gonna go do a whiteboard discussion about uh, moisture curves to cap off this episode. And I think you're really gonna like it. So let's take a look under here. We're at 24. So see, I told you my guess was it's gonna be 25 or 30. That's basically where I'm calibrated. It may still be on. If I open up the meter, it might be calling for water. But essentially I meant to set it at about 50 based on the tricks that I was using of one carat. And then when I moved it after I calibrated the hanging drip, lot more pressure i ended up opening it up basically more it's basically a fine-tuned instrument and you have to know how to use it and since i set it at a basically 24 that's just too wet it's way too wet and that's going to lead like about 30 is where you're going to see that runoff basically flooding so had i been able to hold it above 30 i may not have known until i put the meter in that it was that wet but living soil performs really well when wet and so i'll tell you when we go to the whiteboard the curve but ideally I wanna be in that 50 to 80 range where a lot of people target something higher like 100. I feel like that's way too dry for living soil. The more we do this, I'll be able to give you real readings on what my hand watering looks like versus my automatic watering and we'll make a determination. But we've long known that the earth box holds more water than usual and it performs very, very well. And biology likes that moisture to cycle the nutrients. And when I go over the growth curve, or sorry, the moisture curve, you'll see that ideally we'd be pretty wet, but we don't want no air. And so there's a curve that happens that I'll show you where the sweet spot is and how we're trying to target that using this sophisticated setup. So now that I know we're at 24, I've got the shop back here. I'm gonna not do it on camera because it's loud, but I'm gonna plug it in and get the last of that moisture out so I can make sure that it's not still running. And then I'm gonna use this meter 
And if it gets more moist than that, I know that there's a problem. If it starts to dry back, I don't want irrigation to happen until I get to about 70 or 80. And then if I want it moisture based on the plant and how it looks, I'll redial the carrots just a little bit. So I'm gonna go down here. I can see where I'm at. I've got my original line. Let me see where it's at. And I went one carrot back from that. So now I'm gonna go tighter by one full carrot. I'm gonna do a little bit more because if I'm figuring 40 per carrot, I'm gonna go like one and a half because I really wanna get it up to like 80. So that's where I'm gonna leave it now. That means that we should be good and I'll be able to actually use the meter now. Here's what I could have done. Had I put the meter in the day we filmed this setup, I would have been reading going, wow, it's kind of low and the water's on and I would have just recalibrated then. Then when I moved the water up, I would have seen that it was getting wetter and I could have fixed it. But because I wanted to show you me putting the moisture meter in and discussing how to reset it, I didn't do it. I waited until the next time I could film. I should have had the moisture meter in right next to my regular carrot the entire time so that I was really confident that it was working properly. These are the things that you should do. I'm happy we made the mistake. We can fix it before there's any issue, before we start to flower. And then I'll be able to share with you the results and we'll do it live together here on YouTube. So I'll put the cover back on. I've now got it reset. I tightened it. So now I know that it is tighter than it was. One carrot marking on their distance should be about 40 millibar. I'm at 25. That'd get me to 65. So I went a little further, hoping to target like 80. We'll see if my guess is correct because when this gets to about 80, it should drop back down again because the water turns on. The other thing I'll notice is that when I had it at five feet, I think it was wet enough because this tube wasn't fully intact, like full, it was kind of half full. When I moved it up and I came in today, which I moved it a couple days ago, it was fully full and calling for water down to that 25 level. And that's why it got fully saturated. So I really think it was calibrated around 23, 24. What I need to do last, now that I've set that up, is I need to reopen this. I just need to purge the air out because it ran completely dry up there. So I'm opening the line. Now that I've tightened that, it's not calling for water anymore. So I feel comfortable, nothing's running now. But now if there's air in the line because I ran it all out, I'm gonna purge the air out. Okay, I don't feel any air, but it should, has to come all the way down the line. There's the air. I'm pretty sure that that's enough, but I'm gonna do one more full just to make sure I don't feel any more glugging. Certain that all the air is out of the line. Then I'll shot back that out. Okay, I don't feel any more air. I'll let it full, completely full. No glugging, there was just barely a tiny bit. I think I caught it right at the end of the reservoir there, so it barely got any air in the line. I've shut that down completely now. I'm gonna leave that out here, and then we'll just update you as we go. It's almost the best thing that could have happened because my fear, which you know, you kind of manifest your reality when you think about things, my fear was that I'd flood it. My fear is that I'd flood it like in flower and I'd have no recovery. But in a 20 gallon, max capacity of water in there with a big growing plant, it could just power through it. If I had a fresh young seedling and a big bed of soil and it got over wet and I didn't notice it, that's how you can really get over watered. So let's discuss that moisture curve. Let's go into the other room and we'll discuss the tail end of this. If you've got questions about the super cropping or about any of the other stuff, drop them in here for our FAQ videos. Otherwise, we're probably gonna have a lot of blue mat questions Let's hear the pros and cons. Let's hear what your ideal setting is as far as millibar. Watch the rest of the conversation while I go over the whiteboard with the moisture curve and we do all of the discussion. So let's get going. All right, so we're back and you might've noticed I changed clothes. The GoPro battery died yesterday when we were recording the end of the Blue Mat episode and I wanted to discuss the moisture curves based on our setting that we had calibrated as too moist. And now that we're using the millibar reading on the blue mat tensiometer, I want to discuss what that means, what a tensiometer is, and the moisture curve of living soil and what you can expect so that I think you might leave this video better understanding how to water your plant and how it affects our plants in the soil. So let me just get started. I'm going to draw a basic graph and then we're going to discuss some terminology related to it. And I'll just jump in. If you've got questions about this, post them up. We'll do an FAQ probably just for this type of content because I think there's going to be a lot of questions but I'm also looking for your feedback. So if you've learned about this stuff, I'm certainly no expert. I'd love to hear your input on this content. So I'm gonna draw a basic graph and we're gonna map out a moisture curve. 
And this is going to open up lots of topics of conversation about growing our favorite plant. And so on the left hand side here, what we're going to put is the moisture. And this is going to be by volume, basically a percentage. We're going to have one here and zero here. This is a hundred percent and this is zero percent. So this is soaking wet and this is bone dry. Now there's a lot that, that you can put into this, but I'm just trying to give you the understanding. So you can do a formula to figure out the moisture by volume and it's related based on a few things. So I'll draw it before we go into the graph. If we have a container and it has soil in it, it has all these soil particles in here. Now those soil particles, depending on what it's made out of, can hold moisture differently and give it out differently. It could be filled with rocks and hold almost no water. And so in that case, your maximum water holding or a hundred percent, would not be very much water. But if that's straight vermiculite or straight peat moss, it may be that your moisture holding at 100% is a lot of water. And so when we're using the EcoWit moisture meter, it's basically preset. We can set it. Um, some people put it in a glass of water and set that as 100% as the AD or the, I believe it's the average depletion. It comes preset. And essentially when I'm using living soil, we've noticed that about 35% is ideal. You can certainly go up to 40, 45% and then it swings down to 35. And then when you get down in the twenties, it's time to water again. And that's measuring this percentage of volume. And so if we were to take living soil and we were to pour water in, it's basically going to be water and soil in here. And there's only so much that it can hold before it breaks out and starts getting runoff here. Okay. And that's what happened in our container. Now in a living soil, before it broke down into my saucer and started to leak water, the, the holding point of this soil is somewhere around 30 millibar. Okay. Now this measurement is just a measurement of pressure and it's actually negative. So it's, but we're just going to keep it positive. We're going to graph it positive. I just wanted to mention that we measure that pressure as like a pole, which is a negative, but just for discussion, it's easier to discuss it like this. And so when we found out that I had set it too loose and then I never put my moisture meter in to verify the moisture level. And then where I had set my hanging drip on the moisture meter, I actually raised my, my gravity fed bucket and that increased the pressure. So it, it even skewed my settings further. So when you understand this stuff, you can dial in your blue mats and you don't have to be fearful. Like I used to be when I said, ah, the things can flood. Well, I'm glad that we did it so that we can discuss exactly how to avoid it and exactly where the settings were and what they mean. Essentially that is going to be runoff at that point. And so we want to be set higher than that. Down here is going to be tension. And so what you must understand is that we're basically creating a vacuum and we're measuring the tension on that as the soil pulls water. So in this same here, we would insert a probe, and that has the little reading and that as it drinks, it's pulling water out of here. That creates a pressure difference that pulls a certain measure of pressure on the vacuum and you can read that. And that is where the reading is going to live. And so if you know blue mat, we have a nine inch one right here. That's what we're using. And at the bottom, it's got a ceramic carrot tip. And this is what takes pressure to pull the water out of very much like soil. And so there's water that's completely full in here. That's why we soak it. And there's the reader cap on here with a, and that creates a vacuum inside here. As the plant roots pull water out, the water goes down and that creates suction, which creates pressure. And these are the readings here. So the tensiometer is a very accurate way of reading this because you can have plenty of water, but the soil may not be giving it. When you have lots of compost, it likes to hold on to it. You could also have, very little water, but the plants have easy access to it. And so the tension reading is very important there. And that's what charts the curve. So to understand it, you don't really need to know all this, but I think it helps illustrate it in the mind when we're watering the soil and we're trying to hit a target volume. So a living soil is going to look like this and has a little bit of forgiveness, but essentially up here is completely saturated. Okay. And then over here is pressure. So we have zero, let's go up to 150 and we're going to use millibars. I'll explain the differences in millibars, KPA, kilopascals, and PSI so that it, it paints a picture in your mind. But just know that we're going to be talking in millibars because that's what the blue mat uses. And so let's say that would put us like 75, 100, I'm not going to be perfect here, 125. Let's go like 50. It's not exact. 
Now this is the tension. And so as you get here, it's a lot harder to get water because it's drier. And so up here is the most water. Here's the driest. So in living soil, it comes like this, starts to come down. And then you're going to see this curve like this. Now, I'm not the best at drawing these things, but it's still going to illustrate my point, I think, pretty well. And so this range here is where it's wet. Okay. And one of the considerations on this side is that we have water and we also have EC by percentage, so to speak, meaning if water goes down, EC will go up. And so when you're in hydroponics, it's important that even though your plant may have access to the little tiny bit of water that's in there, that little bit of water will now have so much nutrient in it. Because if you consider all the nutrients that are in living soil made by the biology, if we get less water in there, those same nutrients are in there. So they'll get, they're going to go up by percentage of the water. And so that's part of where we get down here when it gets dry, you can actually burn your plants a little bit. It's harder for them to get water, but what little water they're getting is coming with a higher amount of nutrients. Part of why the earth box crushes so well is it stays in a nice target zone here where it's moist, but it has access to clean water all the time. And I think it's a real powerhouse. The other thing that we'll discuss is the container size. So earth box is pretty shallow, like this distance here. And then the auto pot XXL is really tall. And so that means when I water, there's a lot more gravitational force providing more runoff on this type of situation. And it also, if I'm bottom watering, it's a lot more gravitational force to pull it up to the top. And so that's something just to be aware of. And that's why I think container size and height is also something to be considerate of and something that's important that comes out of this conversation. But when we look at this, that's just something to be aware of. And we look at the graph here, this is the wet zone, but also what is not here? Air, so no air up here. And so the idea is, is once we're fully saturated, that's as much water as it can hold. That's about where we got when I flooded the blue mat over there. But I immediately stopped, and so it's gonna go through this curve as the plant drinks. If your plant is very small here, it's a, it's a big danger. If you have a big plant and cover crop, it can drink through this zone pretty quickly. That's why a lot of us living soil growers saw better results when we started using cover crop because we could target where moisture was easy to get. But if we overdid it at all, there's plenty of roots to drink it and to move through it. And certain plants are better at moving water than others and they have different resilience levels. So wet, no air. Here in this zone, right in this area is easy access to water with room for air. And by air, I just mean air in the soil, ability to get some oxygen in there, ability to not be suffocated because it's completely covered in moisture. And so this is like the target zone we're looking for. And it just by happens, like I was trying to draw the graph, but you can see this zone is from like 50 to say 75 ish. And so this is about the target zone for living soil. And I brought out some graph as references of what like clay, silt, sand, as well as peat and all these different materials, what their curves look like. And I'll try and show you. You can Google them on your own. It's, it's important, but the main reason I did it is to show you the difference in scale and how fickle these measurements are. And that's how precise the blue mat is. And that's why one has to understand this. Use the moisture meter so that you're calibrating things properly, especially when you're brand new. And then you can go by hand for the rest because you'll know like you know. But when we're targeting a range, I just want to give you some perspective. So one millibar. And I want to talk about a way to convert it to what you might better understand as pressure, which is PSI. And the other number that they use on these a lot of times is kilopascals or KPA. So let me give you a formula. 100 KPA, that equals 10 millibar. Okay, so when we're at a 150 millibars here, if we were to divide by 10, that's only going to give us 15 kilopascals. And what's interesting is in soil, they measure this like one to a thousand kilopascals. They talk about like the wilt zone being past like 3000 or something insane when it comes to soil. We're like in this little tiny zone of 150 millibars under 15 KPA and they're measuring like hundreds and hundreds or thousands of these, so to speak. So I just want to let you know that this logarithmic scale makes a big difference in what you're reading. And just know that the meter that we're using has to be very precise to measure potting soil within these ranges where you might use a slightly different tensiometer and different, uh, different circumstances. So I think that's important to note.
Okay, so now that you know the difference, 100 kPa, 10 millibar, basically 10 to 1, the last in your mind, which it helped me a little bit, maybe it'll help you. Let me see, I've got some notes over here. This is like 68.9, I just wanna get it right. One PSI equals 68.9 millibars, okay? So now what you know is that in this range, it takes about one PSI, the plant has to produce that much effort. And so the harder it is down here as it gets drier and drier, it basically starts to stress the plant out because when you get to 100 and say 30, somewhere in this range, it takes double the effort or near two PSI just to get moisture out. Now, I've heard some plants can go up to almost 50 PSI and beyond that, there's very little species that can survive. But if you picture like a desert climate species and that soil being very dry and it's access to moisture being hard to get, these plants can exert a lot of force to get it. And so when we talk about crop steering, which we'll do in a little bit, this range is easy, very low stress. As we get drier, it adds stress to the plant because it has to work twice as hard to get its moisture. And this is, you know, this is independent of VPD and all the other stuff that we discussed. So if it's, if it's low humidity and the plant has to transpire a lot and it's very hard to get it, we're putting double the stress. We're getting stress where it's hard to get the water and stress where it needs to happen quickly because it's constantly losing that moisture to transpiration because of the intense lights and the low humidity. So once we get the environment right, the last piece of the puzzle, the most important part is getting the moisture right in the soil. Now, if we were in hydroponics, we could look at things differently, but in living soil, our delivery of nutrients is dependent upon moisture and air being in there. So you really have to target this range, okay? As we start to get to say like 100, some people will target 100 on their moisture meter. I feel like this is past the easy access. And so it's a little bit too dry for a living soil. And we'll verify that as we go through. One of the things that I'm hoping to do this time is to actually use this tensiometer, this blue mat moisture meter, and put it inside the earth box, putting it in our living soil beds and show you the differences and readings that we're getting compared to the blue mat run one. And we'll start targeting different zones for healthy growth. I've been told by many people that moisture is a little bit better uh, when it comes to living soil, and I believe that. But a lot of times when I'm watering, I water to where it's like in this range for moisture, and I'll let it kind of get out to here before I water. And then the cycle continues, okay? And this is that optimal zone where 10% watering is closer to here, 5% is here. Those are just guidelines that I gave to help people that are learning to water living soil to target a zone where things are easy, okay? One of the reasons why living soil is a little bit harder is we have lots of compost. And compost acts differently. It's a little bit harder to get moisture from. And so understanding that is probably gives you insight into, okay, if I use tons of compost, I'm gonna have to be slightly wetter for it to get access to that water, but I need to have good drainage, which is why we use lots of pumice and rice holes to make sure that we still have access to air when it's in that high moisture zone. Now, if it went down to a drier, pay, like if it went really quickly down like this, and then took forever to dry down, that would be amazing because it'd be super easy to get wet, unlimited access to water, air the whole time, and then it really slowly dried down. That would be almost ideal. Rock wool is fairly similar to that, but obviously it leaves a lot as far as now we have to feed it, it's hydroponic. And so the curve that we're gonna see more in soil is always gonna look like that. And then this soil curve can be altered and you can actually look up different ones based on wood chips and perlite and all these different things mixed with peat moss and see how the curve differs but it always follows this similar path. And so one of the things you can see right away is that when we're at 24 on my reading right here, you can tell I just missed the mark. And when I set it to one carat and my hanging drip, I had the hanging drip just moving a little. You should have it completely off. It should be called a stopped drip, not a hanging drip. If it's hanging and growing still, it's not completely off. And that means you're on the, on the left side of this. You're a little bit more wet. One carat, after the hanging drip should be in that 50 range. I think I set it probably to about 40. Then I moved my gravity up and that really calibrated it to probably around 24, which is where it sat. And so I tightened it and I tightened it. The carrots are the, I tightened it on the top, which I showed you in the video. And I did it about a carrot and a half in hopes to move the setting to about here. That's about as far as I'd like to go. So once I'm confident it's holding there, I'm probably gonna back it up just a little bit and live right here in this range, probably targeting the 50 to 60. And I'm gonna use my gut, my intuition, all my experience to tell you how I feel about this range as we start to see it happen over there in the 10 by 10 series. Lastly, we did discuss a little bit about container size, right? The earth box is shallow. 
a lot less pressure to wick the moisture up. So there's a certain point here where the wicking will stop because it's too dry. And if you go too dry out here, you can get where it's hydrophobic and the peat moss just will not take water. It will not wick it. And that can be a problem. I think in the four x four auto flower tent, I'd let it get a little dry. I think I got a little bit of dry back. So I'm really going to water slowly with some sap in to make sure I get through that. What happens when that happens is you get this increase in EC. You can burn your plants, even though you just watered and you're wondering why you dig around and you notice the soil is dry, even though you recently watered, you could have dry pockets. So using a wetting agent, which is why we've always promoted that the yucca, the Q, makes a big, big difference when we're trying to keep things saturated evenly. That's one reason why you don't want to go out too far. Now, people do what's called crop steering. Now, there's many implications to this. A lot of people take into consideration feeding and all sorts of stuff. But crop steering, essentially when it comes to dry backs, is a way to add stress to the plant. And stress is going to cause it to fend for itself, create more of the compounds that we're after. But we want to do it in a way that's kind of like raising children, where you stress them properly, meaning you show them that they're able to do their job and work hard for it, but you don't just throw them to the wolves. And so in the vegetative period, we want to live in this easy area and just baby them. But as we get to flower, a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll actually push it up in this range. And then let's say you adjusted your carrot. You can always come back and readjust so that instead of it having unlimited perfect water first thing in the morning when the lights are on, and it's just cranking all of a sudden it's like, whoa, I may not have as much water as I think almost tricks the plant into being a little more stressed out. And then you can come in and relieve that and trigger it back. And it goes, okay, I thought it was going to be a bad spot, but it looks like I have resources. And so we're inducing stress, but we're not actually trying to get any wilt or anything like that because we don't really want to stress them. The other thing is that, you know, water, nutrient, all that stuff, it has to be in this target zone because things are pumping when you're going through stretch, when you're going through the beginning of flower. But as you get towards the end, it doesn't need as much. And so we can make it work slightly harder and induce a little bit of that stress, but we're also keeping it from being too much in this zone simply because the plant is not drinking as much, which means that it's not going to cycle as easily through here. So we want to avoid this top level when the plants slow down on drinking, either because it's a seedling or because it's later in flower, we want to be more in this zone. And so that's essentially what crop steering does is we're trying to do little drybacks to trick it into thinking it's getting stressed, but not really stress it. And so you can tell that going from here to here is like doubling the amount of PSI that it takes. That plant has to, actually has to work hard for it. And then we say, just kidding, you're fine. So that's part of that process. Um, other things that we did, we discussed the blue mat carrot, what it looks like, how it works when it pulls, creates the vacuum pressure. That's the reading that we're getting. Normally when you see these curves, there's thousands on here. Like, let me see if I have this one. So this one is a thousand bars or a hundred thousand KPA. And that's at the dry zone and it's got clay, loam, and sand on here. So you can look these ones up and then they have their moisture numbers over here. Well-structured versus poorly structured will have a little bit of a different effect on there. And then you can see the curves. The clay is going to take a lot. It's going to stay wet longer. It's going to be harder to dry out where the sand is going to be wet, but then dry out much quicker and then slowly dry out. But we're in this range here of bars of like, I mean, right here, it's just so different than numbers. When you're going to hundred thousand kilopascals, we're like way off the chart. So this meter measures specifically in this range. That's really good for soil. And I wanted to explain that. Uh, I got a couple other curves. So one of them was from a video. I think the guy is science and hydroponics. Really good. I got a lot of information from here from Izzy. Thank you for driving out here and showing me some of this stuff from Sustainable Village, um, as well as other, there's various white papers that talk about the big differences and moisture retention curves and all the effects that it has. So you guys can geek out on this if it's something you're interested in. Um, this one has peat, pine bark, cocoa core, vermiculite, perlite, rock wool, all sorts of different curves that are on here. Some stay wet longer, some dry off uh, right away, and you can see the differences. This one's peat, core, perlite, pine bark, shredded pine wood, but you can see the different curves on here and how they're affected. These are a little bit better in color. It's easier to see the graph, so Google some of those if you have any interest in this stuff. So we talked about the crop steering. We talked about the target zone. I really think this wraps it up. If you've got questions about this stuff, put them in the video. Otherwise, thank you so much for following along. Um, you can see that we started bending the plants. We're going to have lots of training to do, putting a net on there. We're going to start feeding the build a soil schedule to the back quadrant. And I hope to update you on our recovery from the overwatering on the blue mat and show you that these things, things really work. So if you've got questions, please put them in here. Otherwise subscribe, like, tell your friends. And as always, I'll see you guys on the next build a soil YouTube episode.